Hi comic fans, it's Walt back into review mode after um, sweet holidays. Um, yeah, and I will I will start right away with uh, Batman number 50, the elephant in the room, which was spoiled online uh, by a major newspaper outlet. Um, but I have to say this uh, about the whole spoiling thing. If you build your campaign and your whole shtick for, for almost a year is, will they or will they not? I mean, this is a bit uh, too simple and also like kind of a stupid question to ask um, when you're doing this kind of big wedding thing. And it's also really, really easy to spoil it. If it's a really complex and interesting and meaningful story, then it's harder to spoil it. So maybe Tom King and DC have learned something from this whole thing that you shouldn't play with this whole emotional angle in a yes or no uh, binary kind of way. Um, and it's also what I have to say about the issue. So I had to catch up on Batman. I haven't read it in a while. Uh, I read like 10 or 12 issues in, 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 in one sitting and there were some really great ones. But also the whole, um, the bi-weekly rhythm um, brings kind of a unevenness to, to the whole run because the, um, the artists are changing constantly. And um, then there's this whole CIA-ness about Tom King's writing that feels a little bit calculated and um, He's pushing the buttons a little bit too obviously, uh, for my taste at least, sometimes. And this is what I also have to say about the newest issue. Um, the number 50, it's a, f a $5 book and it's drawn by uh, Michael Janine, who's the main artist um, for this issue. But also in between are a lot of full pages uh, drawn by different Batman artists from um, yeah, the recent past, I would say. And they're really beautiful to look at. Um, the whole issue is, is really easy on the eye. And uh, the story is told, there are like two parallel uh, plots going on. One is the actual preparation for the wedding. It's on. Um, and then there are those splash pages, which are supposed to be letters they write to one another and those letters are very emotional <laughs> which i don't know if you have like those super cool guys and gals in costumes who are super tough and you know um and then they completely open up to you it's kind of a letdown you know it's like you know the cool guy in the class and and from from afar he's always like the coolest person ever and then you meet him and he has like this super weird voice like he you you can't take him seriously anymore and when batman is writing about love oh my god it's hard to swallow for me at least um so yeah i didn't like the purple prose um of the letters and i also didn't like the motivation of spoiler alarm they don't get wet well i i spoiled it already but you know it because it was all over the news. So why don't they get um, married? And this is this feels so um, re. How, how do I put it? It's just not based on real life. It's it feels un. Um, it's not sincere uh, because if you don't want them to to get married. It's because of uh, intellectual property rights and you don't want Batman having this uh, um, problem that Spider-Man had that you can't do stuff with him anymore and you can't introduce new love interests anymore and whatever. It's an editorial decision. It's not a story decision and you can feel it because the story, if they love each other, it's stupid to say, well, Still, have you thought about the fact that maybe uh, Batman derives his motivation from being miserable all the time? Which is 
for me, the stupidest message ever because like everyone knows that, that a stable, loving relationship is the thing that can give you the, the, the greatest power and makes you perform at your absolute highest um, potential and it's not wearing you down and it's not making you soft. Um, so yeah, for me it was a lazy excuse to not getting them married and I didn't understand why this whole build up was, well I do, do understand it from a PR point of view but like from a story point of view this would have been less frustrating if it wouldn't have if, if the whole campaign around it wouldn't have existed um, but yeah Tom King hinted at the fact that this will continue the love relationship will be explored furtherly and you know maybe there's a second chance I don't really care anymore and I also don't really care about his run, uh, Tom King's run on Batman anymore. I wanted to drop it right away. Then I checked and saw that Lee Weeks will come for a few issues on board. And his art, also like his page in this, in this book is the single best thing about this issue. It's a beautiful, um, beautiful page. Simple, elegant. And yeah, I have to check it out. Uh, other than that, I'm a bit tired with the, also like the calculated moves of Tom King and I hope that, um, yeah, his next stint on a mainstream book is a bit more loose and a bit more from the guts and not so much from here. Alright, next up is Harley Quinn, number 44. I really bought it only on the merit of its cover, which is super nice. Um, I don't remember the name of the artist. Maybe I can check it out. Here, cover. Bilkis Everly. Yes, it's her. Uh, Bilkis Everly is the new artist on uh, The Dreaming, uh, the new Sandman Universe book coming out from DC in a few, in a few months. And yeah, I really like the cover. The story is a, it's a second part of a story, but it was decently written by uh, Christopher Sebala, who I didn't know is a funny um, is a funny author, but he pulled it off quite well. And yeah, it's a Harley Quinn book, uh, and it's it's decent, it's it's solid, and I enjoyed it. Uh, yes, uh, also this year Catwoman number one, which again is part of this whole campaign. Uh, but I have to give the, this to them. The cover is really funny, so uh, I do or I don't read Batman 50 first or I spoil the whole thing. Now <laughs> it has become some, somehow ironical that it was spoiled uh, after all. And this is also, for me, it was um, the story itself and also the art. Um, yeah, it's okay. Um, I was more interested in the fact that this is the first of supposedly many series um, by DC Comics who will switch to matte paper. Uh, so yeah, it's a nerdy thing to, to, be, um, to be interested in, but of course we have, we have like the mainstream publishers are only um, publishing glossy paper comics and I'm a fan of matte paper. Um, the coloring is of course not as, um, you don't have all this um, grading um, and uh, fine shadowings and stuff like that but I also don't really enjoy that I like uh, my stuff being a bit more uh, matte and even and um, yeah it was it was fun to look at and it was also fun to read it's an okay book but um, I don't see why I should continue reading this it maybe it's just not for me I didn't really care and uh, it was kind of a average story. So yeah, DC right now has to um, has to step up their game uh, because Marvel is getting stronger and stronger, and um, this isn't very exciting. All right, next up to Valiant books. Um, I will start with Harbinger Wars number. Uh, 
Harbinger Wars 2, number 2, um, which was pretty cool. I really liked the story. Uh, it's by Matt Kint. The art is... Um, not sure what to think about it. I don't think it's a good... It's a good fit for an event book. It's a bit too serious, too heavy and too uh, static maybe also. And also they didn't uh, stick to one artist, they have two. And the second guy, who uh, it's Diego Rodriguez, I didn't quite dig, I have to say. But yes, you know, this is to, supposed to be Peter Stanchek uh, of Harbinger fame. I did recognize him, he looks like 20 years older here, and um, yeah, but it's it's only a minor complaint because I'm always a story guy, and the story was uh, very good, um, it's always a hard thing to include all your heroes, all the universe into 20 pages, and uh, Matt Kind pulled it off, and with the last page we also have a a fantastic cliffhanger and spoiler for a new character uh, and I think I know who this character is but yeah I won't I won't spoil it for you it's cool if you're into Valiant this is uh, a great book to to get right now also Shadow Man number four um, Shadow Man is right now one of my favorite superhero books it's um, it's not crazily experimental or innovative or anything but a solid entertaining superhero book with um, a noir feel and this is ex especially true for this issue uh, it's drawn by Sean Martinborough um, I don't know where I know him from but uh, was it Thief of Thieves he's like a, a very well-known noir artist um, he even wrote a book about it I think how to draw comics in a noir way and yeah it's a noir book and it looks fantastic and it was a nice read um it's the shadow man of the 30s um fighting nazis a, a comic trope uh par excellence and it was a lot of fun um and i really really dig it and yeah i urge you to check it out i think the first trade was released or is about to be released uh, very soon it's easy to get into it even if you don't know nothing about the character and um, yeah it's a very classical take on on superheroes uh, which is entertaining and just well written next up sword daughter number two i raved about number one it's by M uh, brian wood and mac chatter and yes it's another brian wood um Vikings episode, uh, basically it's one large series since the Northlanders. Uh, uh, th there was Black Road and now there is Sword Daughter and yes, there is not much difference in tonality. I, I um, have to um, give the critics this part. Uh, there are a few who are just not excited to read another Vikings book by, uh, by Brian Wood, but for me, it's all about the art here, and not the art, but the silence of the storytelling, which I think is phenomenal. Um, you can see it here very well. It's um, It has a tranquility about it, and yeah, it, it's really immersive. Uh, when, I, when I read this, um, I get sucked into it, and I'm, I, I'm in another world. I can really hear the rain here, and I can... I can hear the waves of, of the Atlantic and yeah, it's fantastic. I still love it. Um, a third issue will conclude this miniseries and um, it's, a, it's a $5 book, yes, but it's also 28 uh, pages of story. So it's a, it's a cool deal, cardstock cover, great book, get it. Next up, Stellar Number One by Image Comics. Um, it's by uh, Joe Keatinch and Brett Blevins. And I knew that this name ringed something um, familiar. Um, Brett Blevins was actually one of those 90s artists which um, if you were a kid in the 90s you probably were in love with 
one or another artist. It was an artist driven industry and he was like one of those weird dudes. Uh, he was the artist on Sleepwalker, uh, he did a run on New Mutants and uh, I think also Ghost Rider. Um, I remember having Ghost Rider comics by Brad Blevins and he has a very unique um, style which is kind of like almost like indie indie-ish um, and kind of dirty uh, but then also clean at the same time it's really weird you can I can really pinpoint it what it is about it but it's it's very recognizable and um, so I didn't find the coloring on the book super successful because you can see that it's changing all the time um, I still got really hooked on it and um, yeah the story itself is um, starts like another you know um, intergalactic bounty hunter um, kind of thing which has become like a sci-fi trope Boba Fett and Lobo and I don't know Star-Lord and all those guys are doing all the same thing and it's always this like cool adventurous um, uh, easygoing type but not here this is more like a super frustrated uh, bounty hunter and it becomes something completely different after a few pages which I really enjoy I really like this when you're you're get, get going into a story expecting something and you get something completely different out of it and this is an examination of um, of power and uh, this character the cover is really not really nice I'm uh, I still urge you to check it out because the cover is not very inviting this character um, has um, a certain power uh, which she doesn't really want to have and she has to come to terms with it and um, yeah it's fun to read um, really cool dialogue great character work and um, I will get this I will I will subscribe to it because I uh, think it's a very special and cool book next up a walk through hell number two by aftershock it's written by Garth Ennis and drawn by Goran Sujuka and um, <sighs> Well, 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 I don't know. I, I, I don't get it. Um, I don't get why this has to be a comic, frankly, because it's just people talking all the time without any backgrounds, as you can see here. Um, and it's a very complicated, um, a very complicated story, which after two issues is still leaving a lot in the dark, literally but also figuratively and um, I mean maybe it reads well in a trade I don't know or maybe it's just supposed to be a teaser for a TV show or this would be a better novel frankly because there is not much to show people are sitting around talking um, there are some really cool ideas it's it's quite original this the, the, the setting is quite original two cops are investigating uh, a container and when you w go into this container, weird th stuff is happening with uh, your feelings and uh, with uh, with everything. You change, um, and it's a it's a cool uh, setup. Um, it's a cool premise, but yeah, very talky and um, not really visual. And um, yeah, I'm done with it. Next up. Robocop number three, another Brian Wood book, uh, this time uh, with Jorge Coelho on art and I love the art of Jorge Coelho. I also love the coloring of Doug Garbark. Um, it's, uh, it's really cool. I really enjoy it. It's, it's very pop arty and um, the story is well told, well paced, um, it's by Brian Wood um, and again the use of, of silent pages and then getting into talky pages it's the perfect rhythm. Um, Brian Wood is really good at it 
and he has found a great, um, I would say, congenial creator in uh, Coelho who's, who's drawing this in a cartoonish way, but still very, very serious at the same time. And, and, and dark without being a, you know, a really dark comic. Um, they pulled it off. It's really cool. The story is, is going places. It's, um, there are new beats all the time and um, I can't wait for the next issue. Great book. Okay, now we come to Marvel Comics who are doing a great job right now. I have to give it to them. Um, the whole um, legacy or fresh start or whatever it is they're doing, it's working uh, because I'm uh, having a lot more Marvel uh, on my pull list right now. I think Marvel is even like the dominating um, publisher and like half a year ago I had like maybe one Marvel book a month or two at the max. Um, so um, yeah, congrats to them. They really steered the ship into a new direction and it's an exciting one. And let's start with L. Ewing and Joe Bennett's Immortal Hulk number two, which um, was almost excellent. Um, but some little beat was missed. I don't know what it was. Uh, it's still very, very good. And I think this will be... Um, a really fantastic run on the Hulk, um, maybe a defining run even. Um, and I'm not saying this easily, but um, if they if they can continue this one issue horrorish um, vibe that they have going on for for a for a um, constant longer period of time. Uh, then this is going to be something that will be remembered. Um, so yeah, um, it's the Hulk, it's Bruce Banner um, going from place to place, from city to small town to small town, and there is a little dark um, and weird story hidden in every small town. We, we all know that from a lot of TV shows and and uh, comics and whatever and um, yeah he explores them and we are witnessing Detective Bruce Banner and uh, Detective Hulk who's uh, illustrated in a very impressive way by Joe Bennett. And I love the coloring, I love the atmosphere, uh, it's a great book. If you haven't checked it out, it's only number two, you can still jump um, on board and um, get it, it's really good. Next up, Doctor Strange, number three. Uh, it's now on my poll list, Doctor Strange by Mark Wade. If you have told me that like, just like a few months ago, uh, I would have said you must be crazy because all my um, Doctor Strange samplings didn't went anywhere, um, but this one here is really, really fun. And I think it's, you know, the successful mix of uh, magic slash fantasy and sci-fi, which um, comics like Saga have perf perfected in a way. But there is, aside from Guardians, but... Guardians is more sci-fi than this year. Um, there is not a lot of um, mainstream publishers who are exploring this um, Star Wars-like uh, potential. And uh, yeah, this feels very much like um, a Marvel Universe answer to Star Wars. You can see it by the character designs. There, there, there are all those humanized aliens. There is magic going on. Um, it's not, it's not the GD force or whatever, but uh, it's getting close, and it's it's a lot of fun. The character work is is well done, uh, the dialogue is great, um, the pacing. It's a fun adventure book. It's adventures in space, and it's featuring uh, the super scroll. So. 
a perfect Marvel comic. Now we come to two creators that I think will be very important for the next Marvel phase or are already very important but will become like the big stars of the new Marvel. Uh, the first one is uh, Matthew Rosenberg and again if like two months ago someone would have taught me that uh, I will enjoy a Rosenberg comic I would have been like yeah sure uh, his We Can Never Go Home by Black Mask um, which was hyped like two years ago and I read it and I gave it one star on Goodreads I really I it was a uh, a torture to get through it um, so I don't understand what happened here but he's a fantastic writer now all of a sudden um, not quite there on this year it's astonishing X-Men number 13 but it's a very you know, this kind of uh, let's get the band back together kind of issue. So it's okay if it's not uh, it's not a punch from the from the get go, but it was fun to read. Uh, nonetheless, um, the art is well, it's by Greg Land. Um, enough said, um, but yeah, it's featuring some of my favorite mutants. And the band leader is Havoc, who uh, is probably my favorite ex character. Uh, it was it was uh, my DJ name uh, a few years ago. Well, more like twenty years ago. So I re I'm really in love with the character, with with the character design, maybe more than the character it's, it, himself. But uh, he stands for a certain era of X Men comics that I loved as a kid, and I think Rosenberg did too. And you can feel that, yeah, we're on the same page here. Um, it's it's funny. It's um, it feels very organic. It's it rings true. It doesn't feel like um, a commission by Marvel, but more like a labor of uh, love for Rosenberg, who who can do his X Men um, thing here, and it's a lot of fun. And I will subscribe it. It's really cool. By the way. Is there like a canon um, how the beast is supposed to, to look? Because he looks even like different on the cover than on the inside. And then we have him here in Multiple Man number one and he looks differently again. Um, well, this was just a side note. I don't care about this uh, consistency things uh, too much. Multiple Man number one. Again, Rosenberg, this time with uh, a, a much better artist named Annie McDonald. I don't really know him, but I loved the art and I loved this book. Uh, it was super funny. If you're a fan of the old Peter David um, X Factor, um, which if you're around my age, you must be, because this was like one of the greatest series of uh well the noughties and um this has the the same humorous appeal it's it's a deadpan humor um it's really really cool and um my favorite characters you have um Ileana rasputin wearing a 60 on the banshees t-shirt sold i mean i'm i'm sold instantly and um yeah it's also really really funny i don't know i don't get it when did Rosenberg become this fantastic uh, master of different tonalities? It happened and I'm happy that it did because Madrox is like... Madrox and Havoc are my favorite uh, ex-characters. Uh, if they can squeeze Leila Miller into this, um, I will be even happier. Uh, but this is a fun, fun book. A lot of fun, a lot of cool character work. You have to get it. Uh, believe the hype. This is just as good as Peter David was back in his heyday. Next up is, um, well, the probably most successful writer of Marvel, um, of the new Marvel, and his name is Donny Cates. And Donny Cates can do no wrong, it seems. Um, he had the, his Thanos run, which is still um, 
it's it has become like a sensation it's still reordered even if uh, the fact that it, it was finished people and comic shops don't care they still reorder the old issues it's crazy uh, he has created an excitement for Marvel comics again uh, single-handedly basically I, I don't know that there is another um, writer who who can pull this kind of thing off right now and um, I really enjoyed Thanos. Um, I'm not a big Donny Cates fan. This is the weird thing. Like his his stuff, um, his for indie comic for indie publishers, um, um, I didn't enjoy very much. But yes, it is true that his DNA, his writing DNA, and the Marvel universe, perfect fit. It's it's just true. And uh, well. This here, it's a spin-off of Thanos. It's Cosmic Ghost Rider, um, who's Frank Castle in the future. And this is, like you can see it here, and it's very, very cocky. <laughs> it's cocky at, at, his, at its peak. Uh, you can s really feel the self-confidence of Donny Cates jumping from the page into your face and giving you a few punches and I like that it's like playing just three punk riffs but really really loud um, it's just that I don't love the art it's not my favorite art and it's it's a bit too maybe too cocky to to read on a monthly basis uh, but I think there are a lot of people who will enjoy this a lot uh, it's not written for me exactly but I get the appeal. It's it's really fun, it's loud, and um, yeah, it's it's good for Marvel. It gives them um, new blood, new energy, as does Venom. Um, Venom number one sold over two hundred thousand copies. Sure, a lot of variant covers and and stuff, but come on. 200,000 copies for a Venom comic um, this has to be also um, because of Donny Cates it has to be and um, I don't know who recommended it to me um, in, in the comments I'm sorry I didn't look it up before the video uh, but thank you very much because it's um, it's a great book and I you know from the from the beginning I wouldn't have thought so. Uh, the, the art by Ryan Stegman, I, I see that it's well done and it's very atmospheric and everything but it's not my kind of art. It reminds me very much of the of a late 90s early noughties um, I don't know Greg Capullo or it has a spawn feeling about it you can see it here um, which I really don't like but even though this is true and I can't deny that I don't like the art <laughs> I still enjoyed the comic which is um, so if this was punk ghost rider cosmic ghost rider this is like very artful uh, metal with a lot of solos and um, a lot of room it's um, the reverb is uh, is is immense and it's a grandiose, it's, it's written on a grandiose scale, uh, which I wouldn't have guessed that Venom has this potential as a character and, and, and that his world can be written in such a big way. Um, so this is a saga um, in the making here. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, you have to. This is a, a defining run, for, not only for the character, but for modern Marvel. Um, it's Venom getting to, to his character core. Um, it's exploring his world, his origins, which are um, very Lovecraftian, uh, turns out. And um, yeah, it's a fantastic, fantastic series. All right, I'm done with the reviews. Um, there is a big comic sale coming up. Um, I will uh, sell again a lot of 
hardcovers, paperbacks, omnibuy. Um, and uh, if you want to support this channel, subscribe to my newsletter and you will get the sale newsletter very soon, probably next week or the, or the week after that. Um, also, um, yeah, if you have suggestions or comments on my reviews, feel free to um, let me know about them and uh, interact with me. You see that I'm reading them and that I get you to your suggestions and I buy books and I'm very happy about it. Um, yeah, thank you for watching and um, have a nice day. See you soon. Bye bye.